Everybody, welcome today to our edition of Format Thesis 2021 SciArc, the theme being archives. It's my pleasure uh, to introduce Mimi Zeiger um, as our um, presenter today. I think it is a truism to say that um, Mimi is prolific. Um, what and where has her writing appeared? I think maybe the better question is where has it not appeared? But in short, everywhere, everywhere from Architectural Review to the LA Times. And, and what has Mimi written about? Um, again, maybe a better question is what subjects has she not touched? Um, but Mimi has written about everything from tiny houses to something I re recently read about toilet paper holders. Um, and uh, she defines herself in an in in a interesting way, which is, she says, I'm, I'm a critic, I'm an editor, I'm a curator, I'm an instigator. And I'm particularly pleased that the critic word is the first word um, that's foregrounded, because I think uh, more than any other time, maybe, um, the role of critics um, and people like Mimi and the work that she does is super important to helping us situate ourselves in a very complicated uh, world. And uh, I think her writings on her adopted city, I don't, I think she's not an LA native as from, from what I understand. Her writings on her adopted city of um, Los Angeles, I think give me particular joy. And I just revisited this little ditty here, a weather report from the city of dreadful joy. you a sense if you haven't had the pleasure of reading Mimi's words, which I encourage you to do. Here's a little taste. Only the Eameses were happy. Charles's Midwest smile, this is why I picked it, Charles's Midwest smile was straight from central casting. Roy, a Sacramento daughter tucked in pinafore, was filled to the brim with gold rush enthusiasm for Los Angeles, modernism, and everyday things of the world. What is a fiberglass shell chair, especially in bright yellow, if not a belief in progress, democracy, technology, and the sunny potential of design? Everyone else was miserable. So very, very happy to have Mimi join us today. And how lucky are we um, that SciArc um, has Mimi as a, as a critic as an educator, as someone in the mix. How lucky are we? So Mimi, please take it away. <laughs> Thanks, Yasmin. What a great intro. Um, yes, it is a sunny and beautiful day here in Pasadena. Um, and I am pretty optimistic that this will go well if the Pasadena municipal tree trimming crew doesn't completely uh, overwhelm us with the sound of trimming trees during the course of this. Um, but thanks to you um, and to Elena and Christy and John for the invitation to be here today. Um, I, I'm excited. I'm excited to share some Midwestern work uh, that I am doing right now. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Is everyone seeing a uh, new middle city as archive? Looks good. So um, this is a project uh, that I'm going to share with you today. It's a um, curatorial and research project that I've been working on for the last 18 months. And it opens to the public this August. Um, uh, it's called uh, Exhibit Columbus. And uh, the title of the exhibition is uh, New Middles. So uh, Elena suggested to me that this thesis lecture series is about ideas of archiving. So I want to talk about the city of Columbus, Indiana, smack in the middle, um, as a kind of archive of architectural thought that bridges between the past, the present, and the future. Um, to do that, I want to start uh, with a land acknowledgment. Uh, and I'm doing this in order to contextualize myself and this project within a longer and broader timeline and geography. So like I said, I'm zooming in from Pasadena today, and this is 
uh, the land um, and as well as the whole of Los Angeles is the traditional territory of the Chumash, the Kish, and the Tongva. And what I'll be talking about today um, is Columbus, Indiana. It's a city that is named for Christopher Columbus in a state named for Indians. The land where it's located was ceded to the United States in 1818 through the Treaty of St. Mary's. And yet this is a place that's been a site of human activity for more than 12,000 years through the rich and vibrant cultures of the Adena, Hopewell, Cahokia, Shawnee, Miami, Kickapoo, and Delaware nations. And the languages and cultures and traditions of these nations continue to these day. Yasmin talked about my different hats that I wear. Uh, and I can think of myself as a critic and a curator, as well as an editor and an instigator. Um, and, and I have the sort of multitude of titles because I've always found myself working at the boundaries of architecture. Um, those blurry edges where dis the discipline meets culture at large. And this is true even from when I was a student at SciArc, um, where I founded an architecture zine. Um, I was trying to sort of reach beyond sort of the idea of the discipline. This has always been a hugely productive territory for me. And those intersections between design and the public, between art and architecture and criticism and curation, those are the middles and the nodes in the network. And here we see some middles. This is the middles of the agricultural circles in the Midwest. So here, this red dot is Columbus, Indiana. It's in the middle of the United States. This is an area that is sometimes left out of cultural discourse, uh, not to mention the discipline. Um, it's considered a flyover patchwork, um, but today I'd like to recenter this middle. This is the middle of the US. It's also the middle of our timeline, a present that owes much to history's long and or underrepresented as it does to any possible spe speculation on what tomorrow will bring. So this is New Middles. This is the graphic logo by Jeremiah Chu of Some All None. Um, and uh, this project, New Middles from Main Street to Megalopolis, What is the Future of the Middle City, is a highly collaborative project. Um, the work I'm showing today wouldn't be possible without my co-curator, Iker Gill, uh, Anne Serac, Executive Director of Exhibit Columbus, Associate Curator Janice Shimisu, who's awesome. Designers participating and many, many uh, members of the Columbus community who have generously shared their ideas, their sites, their properties and resources uh, with us to make the show. Um, I'm grateful for the writings and research of historian Enrique Ramirez. And lastly, many of the archival materials I'll show today are courtesy of Trisha Gilson and the Columbus, Indiana Architecture Archives. So with new middles, what we're hoping to do and what I hope to do in this lecture is to make visible the interconnections between cities and communities, between people, and the ecologies we live in and between our past and our future. So what is, what is Exhibit Columbus? So Exhibit Columbus takes place biannually. So it could be considered among the civic biennials that take place across the globe. It's no Venice. Uh, it's a little bit more localized than that. Um, but it thinks of itself um, as an exploration of architecture, art, design, and community that activates the design legacy of Columbus, Indiana. Columbus, Indiana is a city known as a center of modernism and a place where there's a history in investing in design to foster civic life. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. In 2017 and 2019, Exhibit Columbus installed 
uh, large scale public architectural installations within the downtown and adjacent to notable works of architecture. And we see here two examples, um, one uh, on the left from Brian E. Roberts studio uh, and that one's called Soft Civic and on the right, the exchange by Cyark's own Euler U. So Columbus uh, has this remarkable collection of modern art, architecture and design. And this has been a defining characteristic of the city's cultural identity and a key economic driver for more than 75 years. Uh, here we see uh, North Christian Church in the uh, population of about 46,000 people, right? Like that's about a neighborhood of Los Angeles. Um, Columbus is located in Bartholomew County. It's about 50 miles south of Indianapolis. And it features this crazy collection of signature modern and postmodern buildings by Elial Saarinen, Eero Saarinen, Kevin Roche, Deborah Burke, Robert Venturi, and Denise Scott Brown, SOM, and many others. And Columbus's architectural archives were the result of a half century worth of innovative public private initiatives, which were spearheaded by community leaders most notably the industrialist and art patron, J. Irwin Miller, uh, who lived between 1909 and 1904, and his wife, Xenia Simmons Miller from about 1917 to 2008. The Millers were a driving force behind something called the Cummins uh, Foundation Architecture Program. And this was established as a means to promote design excellence in Columbus. The architecture program began in earnest in 1957 when it supported the architect's fees for the design of Harry Weiss's Lillian Schmidt Elementary School. And since that time, the program has continued as the main force behind many of the public institutional buildings in Columbus. Um, here we see the Irwin Union Bank um, by Aero Saarinen from 1954. Um, a, a, pro a project which is currently the Columbus, um, uh, Com the Cummins uh, Conference Center and, and um, is sort of being continuing to be maintained. And here's another shot of the interior from when it was still a bank. So you can tell that there's this sort of amazing density of sort of really high quality architecture within a pretty small footprint. But you have to ask, like, what is the future of this place? You know, how, who is the future of this place? This is a quote from J. Irwin Miller. He gave this uh, in 1964 at the dedication of the College of Architecture at Ball State University, which is not so far away from Columbus. And it, he said, Design at its best is an exercise in honesty and imagination, not in prettiness. So it is that in an age when product claims seem not believable, when leaders seem not credible, when in every statement we must seek meaning within meaning, the visual presence of honest, sensitive, imaginative designs in things great and small reminds us for the capacity of truthfulness and creativity with which each of us is endowed at birth and over which the years in each of us become. This quote really has resonated with me. It feels extremely. Uh, Iker and I and the whole Exhibit Columbus team have been thinking about this theme, new middles for over a year. And this has been a year, as we all know, it's been devastated by pandemic losses and one marked by uprisings and protest as we recognize systemic racism and the need for societal change. And this past year has made me think about this exhibition and symposium as a very small step towards decolonizing the modernist history of Columbus. This 2020-2021 cycle is a chance for the city to think about its future through design, 
design illuminates meaning. This is what Miller's remark suggests. And it does so through creativity and imagination. And those are the things we need right now. And, and yeah, Yasmin referenced some of my critical writings and the idea of thinking about a social project through a kind of design speculation um, is something that has been uh, central to my work, uh, both criticism and curation uh, over the last few years. Design is a tool that makes visible things, systems, ideas that can't be seen. And the participants that we've commissioned work from have embraced this brief and have taken the ideas that Iker and I have sort of brought to them farther and in directions greater than we could imagine. And I'll show you some of those as we move through the lecture. Um, but I've really become sort of, I really started to believe that this idea of unpacking the archive, uh, this idea of making things visible, of pointing a finger, right? This is a kind of resistance. Um, and it seems especially important right now to sort of rummage through that archive uh, and sort of bring things back into the light. So questions of futurity underpin new middles. So Columbus is often hailed as a modernist Mecca, a tourist destination for architecture fans. And while this is true, um, it can also sometimes feel like it's been frozen in amber, that this hardening and marketing of this mid-century image comes with some baggage. Namely, that the trajectory of the future is always better. It's always about a sense of betterment. And while we can see in this diagram from design futurist Julian Bleeker, uh, which my students from last fall might remember, um, it's this kind of steady rise forward towards betterment. It's optimistic and it underpins much of Western culture as a way forward, but also by default, it devalues what came before as frankly, less better. Instead, I prefer this diagram from the collective Black quantum futurism, which suggests uh, a nonlinear future of the future. Uh, and we can see here that these arrows backwards and forwards to the past, the immediate past, the present, the immediate future, and that they're interlinked. Um, this is a kind of nonlinear or spiral shaped future. And the nonlinear or spiral shaped future is also a diagram which is very um, common within indigenous cultures. So I wanna maybe hold this kind of concept of the, the nonlinear futurity um, as a kind of model that we might be practicing today. And we go here to Catherine Josefina Merla Watson from uh, speaking about indigenous futurism that we cannot imagine our collective futures and note that that future is plural without reckoning with the hoary ghosts of colonialism and modernity that continue to exert force through globalization and neoliberal capitalism. You know, for indigenous tribes, uh, the arrival of Christopher Columbus in the new world in 1492 um, is, is not a point of celebration, clearly. Um, in fact, it's often seen as the beginning of the apocalypse through colonization. Um, when we did our symposium for Exhibit Columbus and New Middles in the fall, um, we, we brought together uh, some speakers to think about the idea um, of, uh, of what an indigenous future might be. And Chris Cornelius, uh, the architect, talked about how native peoples today are not awaiting a possible apocalypse, but they're living in a post-apocalyptic present. And, and I think as we start to think about making a series of public architectural installations in a place called Columbus, we need to think about how a city named uh, for Columbus in this state, of course, named for Indians, 
might start to reconcile erase narratives or recover possible futures that were cut short for some in the interests of others. So in thinking of that, um, artists and architects Jennifer Newsom and Tom uh, Car Carruthers of Dream the Combine uh, are based in Minneapolis. They're also um, one of the five uh, Miller Prize recipients who'll be showing work at, at part of Exhibit Columbus. They began researching their project for New Middles around the same time as citizens took to the streets uh, in their neighborhood in uh, Minneapolis to protest the murder of George Floyd. And the summer uprisings brought a needed critique uh, as well as toppling of uh, colonialist and Confederate monuments. And in this early sketch, they began thinking about civic symbols and place names as elements of power, but also as these complicated infrastructures intertwined with our everyday life. So Columbus is as much a historical figure um, as it might be a city, a sausage company, or even uh, something as mundane as a traffic circle. Jennifer and Tom also mapped all the different towns and cities across the globe that are named variations of Columbus. So that could be Columbia, Colombo, or Colón. This means that Columbus, Indiana, is in the middle of a network of places and not an autonomous island. In recent years, uh, Columbus, as a city, um, may be best known as the name of a 2017 movie by South Korean filmmaker Kogonada, uh, which starred uh, um, John Cho and Parker Posey, among others, as well as the city. Um, and I came across this video study for the movie Columbus early in our research. Uh, like Iker and I, uh, Kogonada was thinking about the future while looking at the past. And um, I'll play this video in just a second, uh, just to note that the church shown under construction here is by Eliel and Aero Saarinen, which was completed in 19. For buildings constructed in the city. Play this. He asks me if I know anything about a time capsule placed inside the cornerstone of the church. There were letters from children sent to the future, he says, to the year 2441. I tell him I don't, but I can check inside. Wouldn't that defeat the purpose, I ask? He tells me that he's looking for answers. How Columbus became the Columbus of architects and artists. Not just how, but why and when. I tell him about a 16 millimeter reel I found labeled Mama Orchids, Building Church. The church? He asks. I think so, I reply. Isn't it funny, he says. They don't know, not yet. So I know that cuts off kind of fast, but I want to wonder what, what is that yet that hangs there in the balance? Um, it makes me wonder, could an exhibition itself be a letter to the future? Um, could a letter create a new timeline branching off into space? Um, as we ask, what is the future of the middle city? Can we do so with a belief that design contributes to not only sort of social progress, but to ecological and social justice. So in conceptualizing the theme, New Middles, our first strategy in both defining what is the middle and in suggesting a new way of thinking about Columbus 
was to recenter the city within the context of the whole of the Mississippi watershed. So that rather than only celebrating this place as extraordinary, which, which it is, um, our hope was to suggest the ways that maybe it was less extraordinary, the ways that it was similar and that was connected and is and connects to places uh, all up and down the watershed. In his essay, Confluences, Convergence and Commons, Enrique Ramirez describes the Mississippi, writing the Anishinaabe people called it Mesipi or Mezzi-Cipi, a word seeming, uh, seemingly meant to capture the essence of this river system curving and bending ever southward, becoming a network of channels radiating like capillaries along the, a watery hand. And it's that network that we're so sort of um, entranced by. And here we see it, courtesy of NASA's Scientific Visualization Studio. So New Middles explores this future of the center of the United States and the regions connected by the Mississippi watershed. And we do so um, not thinking about this, not even as the Midwest or by different states, but as a whole ecology, um, that it becomes connected beyond political borders and that, you know, putting together the show in the middle uh, of the pandemic, but also in the middle of an election cycle, you know, made it really important to begin to think about the cross, the connections and crossings uh, that are embedded in the watershed rather than thinking about red states and blue states. So James Corner in his essay, The Agency of Mapping writes, milieu is a French term that means surroundings, medium and middle and milieu neither has neither a beginning nor end, but is surrounded by other middles in a field of connections, relationships, extensions, and potentials. And it's that last part, right? This idea of connections, relationships, extensions, and potentials that I think is really key to understanding how we're framing this exhibition. And here, you know, it. Corner talks about it, but it's also something that we see here in one of the meander maps uh, from, or two of the meander maps from Harold Fisk from 1944. Um, middle cities are connected by this watershed, right? It's from north to south, from the Canadian border all the way to the Gulf, and from east to west, from the Appalachia to the Plains. And those other middles, right? This idea that there are many centers uh, and I like to think that these centers hold many possible timelines, many futures. And we like this definition of the middle because it connects Columbus to a network of town and cities that share similar concerns about the future. Those are social or economic or ecological. Um, for the cycle of Exhibit Columbus, uh, we had to figure out how to capture the watershed from top to bottom. This is a real difficulty in picturing a vast territory of thinking about it infrastructurally and architecturally, but, but also understanding that an architecture um, installation, um, a commission installation may not be able to capture the breadth of the watershed. Um, but we still wanted to think about what are the architectures of the watershed. So we commissioned two photographers to capture uh, this territory. Uh, this image we see here is from David Shalio. Uh, it's a moment in Minneapolis where the river, uh, the Mississippi River was stopped uh, in order to repair the footings of the bridge um, so people could get out into the center of the river. So it's sort of the relationship between architecture and the waterway. And then here all the way at the bottom is um, New Orleans uh, based photographer, Virginia Hanasuk uh, with the canal, canal Livy breach lower ninth ward, um, you know, a somber reflection on um, the ways that waterways and the infrastructures of waterways fail us. 
What, and what happens, and this is something very important to Ginny's work, is to think about what happens along the Mississippi often has negative results downstream um, as pollution and agricultural runoff create environmental impact on the Gulf. Um, and this idea that something might happen um, upstream to impact downstream and there's this spatial connection between these two places, um, you know, made it important to have someone who was uh, photographing a, a lower territory as well as someone like David who was photographing um, a north and western territory of the watershed. And here we have a LIDAR map um, of the same Mississippi twisting, very similar to Harold Fisk's. Um, Paulina Oja Aspechers writes that uh, the watershed model presents border limits of communities, but as the interconnected edges of complex holes, edges where institutions, peoples, animals, plants and objects create unique combinations. Um, and let's think about that. This is not just about how places are connected to each other, but how they're connected to their ecologies that they're living in or placed in. And as curators, we're interested in seeking out these unique combinations and in recentering Columbus within this timeline of the middle city and that means stretching backwards to include indigenous settlements that predate Columbus's namesake arrival in North America and also pushing forward. Um, it happens to be the bicentennial year for Columbus. Um, so we can think not only like what might the next 200 years bring, um, but you know, what and ref but also reflect on the previous 200 years. So really we're at a kind of pivotal point and wonder about how the twists and turns of this region's history uh, might impact the future. So what is, what is the middle? And what is the middle city? The middle city goes beyond geography. Um, it can be Midwest, it can be mid-sized, it can be middle American. Um, but with our own sort of moment, uh, it makes clear like middle is not average um, and it's certainly not neutral. Um, middle is very much its own condition, uh, especially in relationship to changing demographics, uh, to technology, mobility, climate change, health crises, and the way that cities are trying to address past and present injustice. Um, the Midwest and the middle, you know, is really seeing uh, all of these elements um, come to the fore um, in the way that maybe the coastal cities had seen in other times and are beginning, you know, are sort of impacted in just uh, in, in similar yet different ways. So we're interested in how Columbus is also home to many 20th century archive uh, archetypes. So those very um, uh, sort of special buildings um, are also sort of the building blocks of what make up a city, um, whether those are religious and secular or civic or private. They could be a main street or a bank, a post office, a park, a library, a church, a school. I'll, I'll show you a, a project that is a drive-in in a second. Um, and these are, you know, um, these are great sort of archetypal projects, but also they spaces need to evolve to meet the 21st century and the demands that this current moment sort of poses. So these are, you know, difficult but important questions to ask, uh, to try to answer, like, you know, how might this space evolve? Um, but we've asked 13 teams of designers to tackle them. Let me take you a little bit, introduce you a little bit to our designers for her taking you through a few projects. So there's two different um, categories of designers that we've, well, the designers are all in a big category, but we've, we've sort of given two different kinds of installations. Um, first is the J. Irwin and Xenias Miller Prize. Um, and this is a group of five uh, 
teams um, that were chosen to create large scale site specific installations that respond to the new middles theme and specific architectural sites. Um, they include Dream the Combine from Minneapolis, Ecosistema Urbano from Miami and Madrid, Future Firm from Chicago, uh, Olekan uh, Jafeas from Brooklyn, Sam Jacob Studio from London. Uh, and here we have uh, on the left, uh, Sam Jacob Studios multi-part installation entitled Alternative Instruments, which is along Washington Street, the main street of Columbus, Indiana. Um, and it merges ideas uh, of European modernism with Thomas More's foundational 1516 novel, Utopia. Um, and his project uh, draws from 19th century utopian communities, roadside Americana signage, um, and the work of Venturi Scott Brown to create these kind of folly-esque uh, images. And here we have um, Robert Indiana's classic sign that usually that spells out love here in the language of Utopia from Thomas More's uh, novel. And then when you think about, you know, what is the future of the classroom? Um, uh, the Ecosistema Urbano's Cloud Room um, is a project where they work directly with the students at Central Middle School, the site where it's located, um, to think about what might be a post-pandemic place uh, for a study. In addition to um, the Miller Prize, um, we also have these seven university design research fellow teams. And they were selected for their ongoing research um, through their teaching in architecture and landscape architecture. Um, and they include Derek Hoferlin from Washington University in St. Louis, Joyce Wong from University of Buffalo, uh, Jay Kim from Indiana University, Ersa Lacripa and Steven Mueller from Texas Tech, uh, and uh, Ang Lee from Northeastern University, uh, Lola Shepard and Mason White, who teach at the University of Tor Toronto and the University of Waterloo, and Natalie Yates from Ball State. And if the uh, Miller Prize projects um, were really looking at the kind of archetypal buildings um, in Columbus and making sort of large scale responses to them, the work from our University Design Research Fellows um, is you know, really picking up on ongoing research from these project, uh, from these practices. Um, so whether that is thinking about a, how a the Mississippi water infrastructure uh, from Derek Hoferlin, or whether that's a um, uh, an installation which is sort of looking at the kind of material histories of Indiana limestone and its relationship to uh, indigenous landforms of the area uh, from Jay Kim. Uh, all of these projects are um, you know, sort of taking a way of practicing, uh, a way of sort of delving into complicated bodies of research and making a physicalized uh, project out of it. One, one that has a kind of legibility um, to a, um, a very broad audience. And lastly, um, we have uh, Jeremiah Chu, who runs the practice Some All None, a multidiscipline studio that brings together graphic design, art, and music, um, who has been uh, evolving um, a kind of graphic identity for the exhibition, um, beginning with the new middles typeface. And then uh, as we've gone through our symposium and design presentations, and now as we enter into the phase of the exhibition, um, creating um, a system of uh, graphic elements um, and type uh, that can begin to sort of pick up on that idea of making visible um, and sort of allow people sort of ways to reflect um, through design 
uh, on the projects that they're seeing. So I don't have time to delve deeply into all of the designs, but I wanted to touch on a few that capture sort of the breadth of this new middles undertaking. Um, and I'm gonna single a few out, but I'm by no means playing favorites. Each of our participants developed a proposal that is rich in research uh, in how it engages the city. And you can see all of the videos um, of all of our participants, which were screened at our uh, March design presentations at exhibitcolumbus.com. And of course, if you feel like road tripping, uh, you can come to Columbus in August when it opens to the public. So let's start here at the confluence of the Driftwood and Flat Rock Rivers um, in the year is 1879. And we can see this grid of the city, which still exists. Um, and next to it, we see this marshy and sandy land. Um, and this is a floodplain. Uh, it was the site also of the Mooney Tannery in the 19th century. And later the area was known to locals as Death Valley, a name that comes from a dark history. This quote unquote bad land was home to many of the city's poorest residents as a kind of informal settlement of small flimsy houses that would routinely flood. Um, but by the middle of the 20th century, both the tannery and Death Valley had been demolished. It was replaced by um, a project which was first conceived in 1964 with a project plan that developed a, envisioned a 64 acre site with an observation tower that would connect visually with the courthouse and first Christian church. Um, and that plan was realized in 1993 when landscape architect Michael Van Valkenburg completed Millrace Park, which we see here. Um, and this is a design that is uh, allowed to periodically flood. Uh, there's also uh, a observation tower and other architectural elements like a, um, a bandstand uh, that was designed by uh, architect uh, Stanley Sadowitz. This is the site uh, of a project of two projects, uh, Dream the Combines project, um, and then one by university design research fellow, Joy Swang, uh, who created a non-human architecture in the park um, to emphasize the biodiversity of the urban ecology. Um, this is a project that I see in, here we see the uh, site plan uh, image with her, uh, well, where her uh, nine sort of, sort of nine square grid of uh, installation will go. in relationship with Donna Haraway's critique of the Anthropocene uh, and her discussions of something she calls the, the Holocene, uh, a coming future in which species, um, especially humans, are intertwined with each other, that humans are not the kind of the pinnacle, the apex, um, but really are codependent um, with the uh, other species in their habitat. Two middle species with love um, amplifies uh, habitat conditions of bats, birds, and reptiles. Um, Joyce calls these middle species um, in contrast to flagship species like panda bears, which we also often you know, think of as these uh, species that are very charismatic. Um, and they're, these are all very common um, in our communities and ecosystems, um, these bats and birds and reptiles, yet they remain invisible often in our imaginations of these cities. So her project, um, and here we see a, a model that she showed at the uh, design presentations. Um, they will be made out of Indiana hardwoods and the installation will provide bird perches and function similarly to the bat houses that are used by the endangered bat, uh, Indiana bat. Um, it's one of 13 bat species in Indiana. Uh, and then at their bases, boulders will offer habitat to other kinds of creatures, whether those are you know, insects, uh, lizards, uh, whatever sort of begins to sort of take root uh, 
plant species seedlings um, over the course of the three months. Uh, there will also be um, recording uh, instruments installed in the tower, so uh, the large Sadowitz tower, um, so that we can have playback of bat sounds um, that can be accessed by, um, by visitors to the site. Um, another project, um, or two projects, um, two projects are located at the Commons um, in the center of downtown. We see the old commons. Um, this is not the building that stands in Columbus today, um, but it is uh, a building um, from 1973 designed by Cesar Pelle and Norma Merrick Sklerk uh, of Gruen Architects Associates. Um, it, in its heyday, it housed a shopping mall and multi-level public space. Um, and in 1994, it played host to the Pritzker Prize ceremony. Um, and yet it was demolished in 2008. Uh, and half of the building uh, was replaced by Cotter Kim and Associates uh, as part of a larger um, downtown redevelopment project. Um, and here we can see the, um, the project by um, uh, Gruen and the kind of floor plan and the kind of Act, activated urban space that would take place. Um, sorry, there goes the trees uh, uh, out here, and 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 the way that um, that an architecture hopes to sort of capture activity. The uh, that the other half of the project. Um, so that part that I just showed you was demolished, but the the other end of the building, um, which used to be a Sears, um, remains intact, uh, surprisingly. Um, and it's now used as office space for Commons, um, which is a, a company best known for producing diesel engines and also the city's largest manufacturer. So I wanna show you this project um, by Anne Louis and Craig Reschke of the Chicago-based Practice Future Firm, um, which is looking at the role and future of manufacturing. Um, they proposed a project entitled uh, Midnight Palace, a gathering space designed for occupants of what they call the Midnight City. It asks, what is a public space dedicated to those who live in the nocturnal hours? So here, um, the middle that we're talking about is the middle of the night. Um, the project's a lattice work of electrical conduit, and Midnight Palace features a wall of light inspired by Columbus's streetscape. So those could be, and we're seeing lights that could be high pressure sodium fixtures, LED light bulbs, or soffit lighting. And it also pays homage, homage to the Columbus Drive-In, which closed in 1992. Um, so there'll be screens which will feature community partner programming with um, a local uh, independent movie theater, but also is available for screening cricket matches or short films. Um, and it's built out of conduit. Um, it makes visible the grateful, the graceful labor of electricians, um, which is usually hidden behind walls. Let me just show you this video. It may be a little quiet, but hopefully you can be able to hear it. Welcome to the Midnight City. The Midnight City is located in exactly the same geographic place as daytime Swan Vista Media Center, but it can only be visited from astronomical sunset to astronomical sunset. When the sun is between 12 degrees and 18 degrees below the horizon until the moment when the first light emerges, night buildings replace the day buildings. They are almost exactly the same, but instead of their daytime colors, they are decorated by dining room lights and monochromatic hues. Every evening, the midnight city emerges everywhere across Columbus from east to west. 
Midnight streets replace the regular streets. Nighttime flowers bloom. Nocturnal creatures and insects emerge for their routine. The soft hum of street lights grows in volume. Who lives in the Midnight City? The Midnight City is a city of night owls. Here, 39% of the population works in manufacturing. This is compared to only 9% nationwide. Many residents of the Midnight City are second and third shift workers. They work at one of the city's many plants, keeping the wheels turning 24 hours a day. Unlike those who live in the daytime city, second and third shift workers wake up at dusk and go to bed in the morning. Breakfast is sunset and dinner at sunrise. There are many other residents of the Midnight City, an attendee at the 24-hour gas station, a truck driver passing through on I-65, a hotel night clerk, an avid stargazer seeking a unique astronomical event, a couple not ready for their night's end, an engineer whose family in India has stayed up for a Skype call, a bartender closing out last call, a parent of a newborn soothing their baby. Um, sorry that that was a little bit uh, low. Oh, keep going. <laughs> However, many civic amenities open when they serve the daytime city. Midnight residents don't take the Kalam bus, which stops at 8 p.m. They do not visit Noblet Park, which closes at sunset. They do not eat at Ramen Alley, Jill's Diner, or the Garage Pub and Grill. Those places are closed. Most of the Midnight City's popular locations are located along the highway and serve midnight travelers. These include 24-hour gas stations, restaurants, and stores like Walmart. How can we design for the midnight city? What is the public space dedicated to those who live in the nocturnal alley? Um, so sorry about the, the sound is a little low on that video, but I hope you were able to catch uh, some of it. But I think what's really important about this project is that this research and design um, suggests that 20th, 20th century ideas of public space um, and who uses public space are really out of sync with 21st century questions of labor, leisure, and urban amenities. And we should also think about um, you know, those folks who do work with the different shifts um, you know, it also becomes questions of class and race about who is being served by the city and who is doing the serving. So I think what's nice about this project is it's turning um, our understanding of time um, and with it, uh, the, the idea of who is a user uh, on its head. And so we think about the middle of the night rather than noon um, as sort of the middle of what we're designing for. And it gives us a whole different set of parameters. Oh, here it goes again. Here we go. Um, so the last project I want to share um, is by Brooklyn-based designer Alalekan uh, Jeffus, and it's located at the Cleo Rogers Memorial Library uh, by I.M. Pei, and um, here we see the big green uh, large arch by the artist Henry Moore. Um, here we see a photo taken at a dedication ceremony on May 16th, 1971. Like that was really just over 50 years ago. And the library was built early in Pei's career across the street from First Christian Church. Um, and Henry Moore's large arch frames Elil Saarinen's church tower, which knits together the civic space with the more sacred, um, and the plaza where uh, Pei is standing and also where this project will be, uh, the project from Lake 
will be located is thought of um, within the community as the city's living room. Um, so, you know, this becomes a really discursive space, a, a space for sort of ideas to be played out. Uh, the library opened in 1969, and in his research, Lake discovered that an inaugural African art exhibit opened in January 1970, and it was part of Africa and Black and White America, a two-month-long program developed by the city's Human Relations Commission. What's critical and surprising about this material is that it had been largely forgotten until he kind of dredged it from the archive. Um, tucked away, um, its import was buried under the image of the city as a destination for modernist architecture. Um, but you know, the city has had many different ways that it's been linking questions of society with questions of design. And the press releases we see here on the on the right um, could really echo our own condition, um, the questions that are going on in the United States today around race. Uh, one paragraph begins, violence in the streets gains instant attention, but only hardens prejudices and does not provide the basis for mutual understanding. And the same year, the commission organized the Columbus Black Arts Festival. Entitled uh, Archival Revival, Lake's design revisits these two events through sculptural and augmented reality elements representing key figures that have been revived from the Columbus, Indiana architectural archives. So I wanna close with a few minutes of his proposal, Archival Revival, um, which asks us to uh, reconsider these inherited uh, histories. The Cleo Rogers Memorial Library officially opened in December of 1969. One of the very first exhibits to open was an African art exhibit, which took place in late January of 1970 and was located in the library's gallery on the plaza level. The exhibit was part of a two month long program developed by the Human Relations Commission called Africa in Black and White America. In the fall of that same year, the Human Relations Commission then organized the Columbus Black Arts Festival. It lasted for about six weeks with all but one event taking place at the Cleo Rogers Memorial Library. My project revisits these inaugural and transformative exhibits through a series of engaging, interactive, and programmable threshold slash moments that allow visitors to explore their historical significance to our present and future realities. The four threshold slash moments are inspired by news clippings from the library's archives. The African art exhibit is an unintended acknowledgement and celebration of the influence African sculpture had on modern art and architecture. In addition, many of the sculptures in this exhibit were on loan from Indiana University's Eskenazi Museum of Art. The news clippings are abstracted into silhouettes, which are then developed into a series of pop-up installations that encourage a variety of engagements with the visitors to the plaza. The viewing platform provides a space to gather, rest, and people watch. AR markers embedded in the platform surface activate sculptures from this 1970 exhibit and connect them to relevant examples of contemporary art. Marie Evans, a native of Toledo, Ohio, has become known as a Hoosier poet and television personality. The topic of her discussion Thursday is poetry and black experience. She is producer and director of The Black Experience, a weekly program carried on WTTV Channel 4 in Indianapolis. The silhouette for Marie Evans is inspired by several lines from her poem, I Am a Black Woman. The pop-up installation visual interactive experience where one can view archival footage, listen to historic audio, as well as engage with relevant texts from contemporary writers. Graduate student at Indiana University and a native of Aliceville, Alabama, will be hanging 68 of his prints in the basement of the library just south of the children's room. 
the architectural suggestiveness of Brooks and Tatlio print compositions are very compelling and provide a fascinating point of reference. This silhouette derives from his prints, animistic business, and an Benches embedded with AR markers provides a virtual gallery experience, allowing visitors to connect with the work of Wendell T. Brooks. Bleacher-like seating extend from the perspective lines of the silhouette into a platform for small performances. Felix Eboigbe, a native of Nigeria whose works are on exhibit at Cleo Rogers Memorial Library, carves a wood sculpture of a female figure at the library's artist in residence workshop. Mr. Eboigbe, who is on an art fellowship at Indiana University, is visiting Columbus this week and participating with a dozen other artists in the workshop. Felix served as an artist in residence and teacher at Indiana University for over a decade. He cites Henry Moore as an influence, yet prefers the medium of wood. A pop-up installation provides an informal threshold and in entry into the plaza, also extending gallery. All right, a little bit of an abrupt ending there, but um, you can watch the whole of uh, that video um, on the Exhibit Columbus website. Uh, so Lake's uh, work is really best known for questions of Afro um, and solar punk futurism. And I think uh, one of the works that he just came off view was part of reconstructions uh, at MoMA and his work uh, in the Venice Biennale at MoMA. And so questions of how we think about the future or how we insert something into the timeline which might sort of reflect a new future is part of his practice. Um, so in rescuing these programs uh, and the artists from the solitude of the archive, Blake's work inspires a multiverse of futures for Columbus which are drawn from Black creative practice and experience um, and are stories that are largely erased from the dominant uh, narrative. Lake, for instance, um, spent part of his teenage years in one town over uh, from Columbus, Indiana, in Bloomington, Indiana. Um, and so this is, a, in a way, kind of reconnecting his experiences back into our understanding um, of what is Columbus, Indiana. So. Oh, the sad part again. So I hope that in unpacking the city as an archive, um, it gives us some insight into how a place uh, might be known uh, and can be opened up for questioning via research and exhibition. And that it also illuminates um, something um, that Pedro Gajano uh, talks about as a practice of critical curation, one that maybe combines or merges uh, the poles of, of uh, being a critic and being a uh, curator. Um, so with that, I will stop sharing and thank you and we can open it up for questions. Thank you, Mimi. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? I know, I probably just exhausted you with all of that material. <laughs> Thanks, Mimi. It's a um, fantastic to hear about all of this, the, the backstory behind this exhibition, and I hope to be able to experience it. Um, I think one thing I, I'd love to hear more about is uh, you talked about your practice as um, a practice that sort of combines approaches to design projects and social social questions, social engagement. Um, and then as you finished, you talked about the kind of critical curation. And I think it's really provocative that you are working with the archive in this exhibition. It's so, as something that takes on a new life, just as demonstrated um, by Olalakin JFS's work, where voices from the archive that maybe we only have a photograph or a newspaper clipping, um, maybe we have a, a poem or a photograph, a painting, something of that nature. But then the way in which um, Olalakin's project brings that kind of into a new life and a new way of public engagement and position overall as bringing the archive kind of out into the streets, onto the buildings, into the parks. Um, so I'd just be curious, yeah, how you're, how you're thinking about that. This sort of almost like a living archive, I was thinking. It's beautiful. Yeah, I mean, I think this 
you know, part of this living archive has emerged through um, through the course of working on this exhibition, right? I don't I don't know if we came to the project um, with the idea of like we need to uncover all of this material and make it public, um, but that as we sort of framed this brief uh, for our practitioners, their hunting and pecking through the archive, as well as our own hunting and pecking through the archive, um, made, uh, made it impossible sort of not to want to, to foreground it because it tells us new stories about a place, right? So when we understand a place that has um, a piece of history, you know, thinking about African art and the relationship of black and white people, you know, in Columbus, Indiana in 1970, right? Um, we can't help but sort of think about, well, how, how does knowing that piece change how we move forward, right? How a city understands itself. And uh, Columbus, Indiana, we talked to many, many um, community members in the course of putting together this exhibition, um, is doing the same kind of self-reflection um, as, um, as places everywhere in the country. And so when you, know, when you uncover one piece of the archive, um, you can shape a new story, a new narrative uh, about who it is. Um, and so it's a little bit different, say, than a kind of classical preservation technique, right? Of, putting, of wanting things to stay fixed in a certain time. It, it's more um, about sort of a, a layering or kind of that, that sort of watershed model, right? Of drawing connections um, between different things. Any other questions? Last one. Hi, Mimi. Um, hey, Dick. I how how can we best? I guess I, I'm just thinking specifically about my thesis, where at the moment it's working on a site in the Navajo Nation, and how how can it best not be a seen as a colonialization project? Um, and how, it, like, is that even possible in 2021? And if so, how, how best to do that? <sighs> um, without knowing your whole of your project, I think when you engage people whose lived experiences, um, you know, are, you know, from indigenous communities, um, I think that those making sure that those voices are part um, of the conversation. Right, if that's part of your research, right, so that it's it's not about creating um, a series of assumptions uh, based on something that you think you know, but actually um, engaging people with um, within that discourse. So, for for our project, um, uh, so Derek Hoferlein um, will be working on a series of uh, programs um, that we'll be hosting in the fall, thinking about the water, the Mississippi and the whole of the watershed um, with um, two uh, indigenous artists. And so, you know, when we, when we want to do program, we want to make, make sure that we're not suggesting um, a kind of top-down expertise, right? That we're kind of creating more like creating platforms for dialogue. So I, I don't know if that helps necessarily with the thesis project, but it, it suggests that there are uh, maybe more voices that may need to come into conversation. Thanks. Thanks, Nick. Did, did somebody else want to make final comments or? Elena? Oh, I just wanted to thank Mimi for her time and her insight to uh, towards our um, graduate thesis uh, class and thank all the faculty and the students that are here and in our live stream platform. Uh, it's 3.11, so I think the students have to go back to their own instructor. So thank you, Mimi, for your generous uh, intellectual engagement and the knowledge you shared with our students. And we're looking forward to seeing this live or at least uh, on Instagram live, let's say. <laughs> um, yes, uh, and maybe maybe some of you can uh, 
come join us uh, in the Midwest in August. It's before school starts. So thank you so much, Elena, Yasmin, Christy, John, the whole, uh, all of the students. I see uh, some familiar names in the audience today. So <laughs> thank you, uh, Mimi. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone.